Good morning. It's good to see you this morning. Let's stand. We're going to sing about our risen Savior. So let's stand. It says, I am the living one. I was dead, and behold, I am alive forever and ever. And that's in Revelations 1.18. So let's sing about our risen Savior again this morning. it is great to be in your house, Lord. We thank you for the blessing of being a community of believers, Lord, that you put us together here. And Lord, I pray that we feed off of each other, Lord God, that we learn to lean in and Lord, learn from each other. And God, we pray blessing over our service today, Lord, that your name would be lifted up, that you would be glorified because of our attitude, because of our submission to you. Father, I pray today because you're going to speak to us, Lord, as we talk about our conscience and talk about what it means to carry guilt. Lord, I pray today, Lord, that you set us free, that you show us your way and how you want to operate with us. And Lord, when we get obedient to you, Lord, that becomes our worship. And so, Father, I thank you for today, a beautiful day outside. Lord, make it beautiful inside so that you get glory and honor. We pray that in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. You be seated. Good to see you in Pickensville, Alabama this morning. I pray the Lord gave you a wonderful, wonderful week. Uh, I want to start out by saying how much I appreciate all the people who contributed to the last Sunday's service. It was wonderful, okay? I even had my boss, who's our, uh, well, he's a hired, not my immediate boss, but our VP of sales for the entire nation. And uh, he said, I was watching, he says, for a church of your size, the music power is just amazing. So I thank all of you for, for that contributed to that, and all of you who contributed by being here. And it was just a great Sunday, was it not? If you missed it, you ought to go back. We have them recorded. They're on a YouTube channel, and go back and look at it. it it's great. So thank you for all those things. I don't have much to announce this morning. I do want to tell you, if you missed your opportunity to give to Annie Armstrong, you can continue. You can still do that. But also, uh, this Wednesday night, we're, we've been studying the book of Ephesians on Wednesday night. We talked to the men last week, so the men, you need to bring your wife this week, okay? Uh, we are studying the book of Ephesians. 
We eat, we do a catered dinner, so, so I hope that you'll sign up. There's a sign sheet, get your name up. Some of you haven't been, I hope that you'll come and be a part of that, okay? That's all I've got for announcements. I'd like to recognize birthdays. Anybody had a birthday? I know we've had a couple of birthdays. I know of them. Come on. Yeah, come on. What about, come on, come on. Stand up. We're going to say happy birthday to them, okay? Happy birthday to you. Time. Turn around, wave up, smile with your way. Good morning, good morning. Let's continue singing this morning with I Stand Amazed in the Presence.
our giving, okay? Father God, as we come together, Lord, to worship you and we get word of instruction, Lord, it's also a time we give ourselves. Father, not just in this building, not just to this church, Lord, but we ought to be a people with a heart of giving, God, that we see opportunities and, Lord God, we recognize that you have opened those doors and we step through them. We meet needs. So, God, I pray that you put that spirit within us. It is the spirit of you alive in us. So, Lord, Lord, I pray that it awaken and, God, you use us, Lord. So whatever we give, wherever we give, God, we pray blessing on it. We pray, God, your anointing to do great things. God, we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated. Take your Bible. We're going to Genesis chapter 41. Genesis chapter 41. We're going to begin reading in verse 54. Now, some of you already have some of these notes filled out if you kept your old sheet because we are returning to this sermon titled uh, The Resurrection of a Dead Conscience because your preacher couldn't get through last time. He's going to try today. I've been given a little extra time, so we're going to get started. We need to rebuild a little bit where we were last time just so we have an understanding, and then we'll get into completing this thing, okay? Look with me, if you will, in Genesis chapter 41, verse 54. I'm going to read quite a bit. And the seven years of famine began to come, just as Joseph had said. Then there was famine in all the lands, but in all the land of Egypt there was bread. So when all the land of Egypt was famished, the people cried out to Pharaoh for bread, and Pharaoh said to all the Egyptians, go to Joseph. Whatever he says to you, you shall do. When the famine was spread over all the face of the earth, and Joseph opened up the store, all the storehouses and sold to the Egyptians, and the famine was severe in the land of Egypt, the people of all the earth came to Egypt to buy grain from Joseph because the famine was severe in all the earth. Now Jacob saw, that's Joseph's dad, okay? Jacob saw that there was grain in Egypt, and Jacob said to his sons, 
Why are you staring at one another? He said, Behold, I have heard that there is grain in Egypt. Go down there and buy some for us in that place that we might live and not die. Then the ten brothers of Joseph went down to buy grain from Egypt. But Jacob did not send Joseph's brother Benjamin with his brothers, for he said, I'm afraid that harm may befall him. So Jacob is still leery of these brothers. He had let little Joseph go off with them once upon a time, and Joseph didn't return, so he still wonders about that. It says in verse 5, So the sons of Israel came to buy grain among those who were coming, for the famine was in the land of Canaan also. Now Joseph was the ruler over, all, over the land, and he was the one who sold to all people of the land. And Joseph's brothers came and bowed down to him with their faces to the ground. That is an answer to Joseph's dream. He told them many, many years ago, some two decades ago, that they would all bow down to him, and it came true right there, that point. Verse 7, when Joseph saw his brothers, he recognized them, but he disguised himself to them and, they, and spoke harshly to them and said to them, where have you come from? And they said, we are from the land of Canaan to buy food. But Joseph had recognized his brothers, although they did not recognize him. Joseph remembered the dreams which he had had about them, and he said, you are spies. You have come to look at the undef undef undefended parts of our land. Then they said to him, No, my Lord, but your servants have come to buy food. We are all sons of one man. We are honest men. Your servants are not spies. Yet he said to them, No, but you have come to look at the undefended parts of our land. But they said, Your servants are twelve brothers in all, the sons of one man in the land of Canaan. Behold, the youngest is with our father today, and one is no longer alive. Joseph said to them, It is as I said to you, you are spies. But this you will, by this you will be tested by the life of Pharaoh. You shall not go from this place unless your youngest brother comes here. Send one of you that he may get your brother while you remain confined, that your words may be tested, whether there be truth in you. But if not, by the life of Pharaoh, surely you are spies. So he put them all together in prison for three days. Now Joseph said to them on the third day, Do this and live, for I fear God. If you are an honest man, let one of your brothers be confined in your prison. But as for the rest of you, go carry grain for the famine of your households and bring your youngest brother to me so your words may be verified and you will not die. So they did so. Then they said to one another, truly we are guilty. So here's their conscience being aroused. Surely we are guilty concerning our brother because we saw the distress of his soul when he pleaded with us, yet we would not listen. Therefore, this distress has come upon us. Reuben answered them, saying, Did I not tell you? Do not sin against the boy, and you would not listen. Now comes the reckoning for his blood. They did not know, however, that Joseph understood, for there's an interpreter between them. This is part of the facade. Joseph has his interpreter standing there because he wanted to make sure that they saw him as legitimately an Egyptian. So he's got an interpreter standing there, but he hears and understands everything they're saying. It says now, verse 24, he turned away from them and wept, but he returned to them and spoke to them. He took Simeon from them and bound him before their eyes. Then Joseph gave orders to fill their bags with grain and to restore every man's money in his sack and to give them provisions for the journey, and thus it was done for them. So they loaded up their donkeys with the grain and departed from there. As one of them opened his sack to give his donkey fodder <coughs> at the lodging place, he saw his money, and behold, it was in the mouth of his sack. Then he said to his brothers, My money has been returned, and behold, it is even in my sack. And their hearts sank, and they turned trembling in one another, saying, What is this that God has done to us? It took two decades, but the brothers are back together again. The only thing is, is they don't know that Joseph is with them, okay? A lot has changed in this, thing, this time. The boy has become a man, and the slave has become the prime minister. But they come, and they're standing before him. They don't recognize him. He immediately knows them. And what I want you to understand is God is using this encounter to get them right. 
God is using this not to punish them, but to resurrect in them their conscience. They had pushed it down and put it away. Therefore, I call it the resurrection of a dead conscience. We talked last time about how the conscience is seared. We're going to talk about that again today. We talked about how it is stirred. And now, this morning, we will finish up about how it's saved, okay? We need to rebuild. We need to, 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 to react and, and go back through some of this. So we need to understand what a conscience is. For those of you who were here a couple of weeks ago, hope I don't bore you to death with everything. I have some new stuff, okay? I remember one time, I, I used to travel a lot before COVID, but I was in Oklahoma City. I went to Oklahoma City um, probably 25 or 30 times one year. And I was in Oklahoma City. I always stayed at the same embassy suites. I just liked it. It was out by the airport. They had breakfast in the morning. So I stayed there all the time. Well, I remember, I, very, I can still see the room in my eyes because they all look the same. I had an 8.30 appointment and all was well. So I woke up that morning with light filling the room and I began to stretch. You know how it is. And then all of a sudden I thought, it's too light. And I jumped up and looked at the clock. It was 8 o'clock. I had an 8.30 appointment. It was an important appointment, okay? One of the largest school districts in the, in the country, Oklahoma City Public Schools. So I jump up. I wet my hair. I brush my teeth. I put on more deodorant than I usually do. And I, you know, out the door I go. Same underwear as yesterday. But I go, and, I, and I, to help you understand how your conscience functions, I want you to think about an alarm clock. Mine didn't work that morning. A good alarm clock does two things. It is quiet when you need to sleep, and it is loud when you need to get up. Those are the two things that an alarm clock does. That is what a conscience does. It doesn't bother you when you are obeying your conscience, but it does alarm you, it does shake you, it does wake you up when you disobey your conscience, when it is time. It is a good warning system to your soul. Now, you and I both know, just like every other part of our life, it has been disordered. It has been caused to malfunction because of sin in our life. We are fallen creatures, and because of that, our conscience will malfunction, and it doesn't go off when it's supposed to, or it goes off when it's not supposed to. By definition, your conscience is the inner sense of what is right and wrong. And it motivates you to make one decision or another, okay? Your conscience is not your spirit. It is not the Holy Spirit. It is not your soul. It is none of those things. Everybody has a conscience. I know sometimes it looks like they don't, but I promise you, everybody has a conscience. The thing is, is your conscience is trained, you train your conscience to respond based on your experience, based on what you feed it, all of those things. So your conscience rewards you when you obey it. So if you do what is, it, it, you believe is right, what you have intrinsically taught yourself to believe, it, then it gives you peace and it makes you feel good about yourself. If you dishonor it and you go against it, it brings guilt on you. It punishes you. So the idea is, is that your conscience is not a reliable guide all the time. Why? Because it can be seared. It can be trained to think wrongly. I read a quote, and I'm going to read it again. John MacArthur says this, The conscience, however, is not infallible, nor is it the source of revelation about right and wrong. Its role is not to teach us moral and ethical ideals, but to hold us accountable for the high standard of right and wrong that we know, that we know. I told you, everybody has a conscience. And you say, well, then how come people do these atrocious things? How come people treat others so badly? How come they just make poor decisions about themselves? How can that be if they have a conscience? Because consciences are trained. If you believe in the Bible and you believe that the Word of God is the instruction, you believe in the Holy Spirit, so you apply those moral principles, you train your conscience to react to that. But if you believe that Hinduism is right or any other uh, Mormonism or, or Hinduism, any of the other isms out there, if you believe those are right, then you react to those. 
If your conscience is taught that cursing and living wickedly and having no affiliation with religion is, is, is right, then that is your right. That is your compass. You get the idea? Say, I do. All right? You're not married, but just say, I do, okay? To apply it to Joseph's story, let's talk about how the conscience is seared. How the conscience is seared. They are guilty. Let's get that out there. They are guilty of wanting to get rid of their brother. They are guilty of wanting to sell him. They are guilty of wanting to murder him. So there's a lot of guilt to go around. And in that, they create this this false narrative to their father. They go to their dad, they take Joseph's coat, they put an animal's blood on it and say, we found this. I guess he got, as we would say in the South, something done ate him up. Something jumped on him and, 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 and... all of this, and when they, when they lied to themselves, that's one thing. But you know they had to feel some remorse as their brother was taken away. We just read that they said, we did not listen to him. Surely that pulled on them because it's being resurrected. So those feelings were there earlier. But the one that really gets me and how badly we can sear our conscience is that they lied to their dad. They brought that false narrative to their dad and they watched him suffer for all those years. But as time does, time began to dull that guilt. And time began to to lessen the remorse that they felt. How is that possible? Because these brothers have seared their consciences. Searing is like like a burning or a scar or whatever you have. It deadens the nerve endings, and you can do that to your conscience. The Bible tells us that, that people sear their own conscience as with a branding iron about the things of God. We used this story to illustrate last week, and I'm gonna I'm gonna do it again. The Avivia Avian Avianca Airlines. Avianca Airlines, I'll get it right, a Spanish airline. How about that, okay? In 1984, crashed dead into the side of a mountain. They went up and they got all of the materials. You know how they do. They found the black box and they listened to the recording. And they heard the recording of an English-speaking recording, a lady's voice saying, pull up, pull up, pull up. And they heard the Spanish-speaking pilot mumbling things and talking to things. And after a few minutes, pull up, pull up. What does he say? What does the, what does the guy say? Shut up, gringo. And he turned the switch off. And soon they crashed headfirst into a mountainside. Shut up, gringo. There are times in your life where your conscience is saying, pull up, pull up. What do you do with that? If we heed that voice and we pull up, all is well. If we don't heed that voice and we do as we please, we have begun to sear our conscience and the outcome of that can be devastating. The next time the voice of your conscience tells you to pull up, it won't be as loud because you ignored it the last time. And the next time it says to pull up, it will be fainter yet. So the idea is that we train our conscience. There is a flip side. I didn't get into this a lot last week. There's a flip side to a dead conscience, a seared conscience. And you know what that is? It's an overreactive conscience. Some people, Romans chapter, chapters 14 and 15 talk about this. People who are raised in, a, in a, uh, an atmosphere of legalism, and Lord knows we live in the South and that are, there's plenty of that to go around. But there is, there, there is an idea that we are taught that everything's wrong. <laughs> Have you ever felt that? Well, the church thinks everything's wrong. Well, that is an overactive conscience. And it is what's called being raised by tradition. Being raised by tradition. Rather than what the truth of the Word of God says. So understand that there can be an overaction that you are feeling guilty about things that are really not sin. (laughs) But yet you have trained your conscience in that way. 
There are people who are, have a great conscience. They, they know that they have freedom in Christ, that they are free to do things, and they are, they are comfortable with that. But your challenge is that there will be people around you that could be harmed by the things that you do. And the Bible tells us that we need to be considerate of our brothers and all those things. So is this making sense to you? The, I just want you to understand about your conscience and that it can be seared, it can be overacted, but the main thing is, is that it is trainable. It is trainable. So how is the conscience stirred? We got into this last week. The brothers of Joseph allowed their hearts to become hard. They sear their conscience. But God is at work, and God uses several events to bring this back to life. Mark this down in your mind, if not in your notes. God knows how to wake you up. God knows how to wake you up, how to push the right buttons to get your attention, all of those things. Not a person in this room doesn't know that. So how did God use, what did God use to stir them up? We talked about it last week, problems. The problem that they faced was the famine. God used problems to stir them up. This worldwide famine, there was no other reason that they would go to Egypt. There was no other reason they would really talk about going to Egypt. But one day, they're all starving to death, and Jacob looks and says, why are you staring at one another? Why don't you do something about this? You know what to do. There's grain in Egypt. Now, this is a side story. I happen to believe they're thinking, I don't know. We sold Joseph over there. Maybe not, but, you know. But Egypt is where they need to go, so that's where they go. And the famine has already, in this statement by Dad, to go get some grain, has begun to wake this up. That's where Joseph is. So God used a problem. God used people. So these boys head to Egypt. Joseph recognizes them right away. I don't know if he's been expecting them. I, 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 surely he thought that there's a possibility that they would show up because everybody in the whole world that they knew at that time was starving. They don't recognize it. I don't want to get into all this again, but the Egyptians shaved all the hair, eyebrows, everything. The Hebrews would wear a beard, all those things. So here is Joseph. It's been 21 years, and he stands before them. They also wore short skirt, skirts. I don't know what it is. <laughs> well, the Hebrews wore long, so he looks totally different. It is not surprising that they wouldn't recognize him, and surely he recognizes them. And he begins to talk tough to them. So God's using Joseph now to stir them up. You're spies. I know that you're spies. No, we're not spies. A third thing is that God used pain to stir them up. What is the pain? They're being accused of being spies. You are spies. I know you've come and you're trying to find out where our weakest points are. I know what you're doing. No, we're not. We just come to buy groceries. We, that's the only reason we're here. No, I know that you're spies. No, we're from Canaan. We're a family of 12 brothers, and our youngest brother's at home. One of our brothers is dead. I wonder how that felt to Joseph when he heard that. And he says at first, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to keep you boys in prison, send one of you back, but then he changes his mind, and he keeps one in prison, sends them all back. Joseph throws him in jail. God will get your attention. These men never thought of seeing Joseph again. That is not there. But what is there is the guilt of the way that they treated him before. Their conscience that has been dead is all of a sudden alive. It is alive and well. The famine drives them to Egypt. They are now right where God wants them. If you belong to the Lord, you need to understand that God's not going to allow you to wallow in your sin. He is not going to allow you to stay off of his course. He is going to work in your life. Your sin or conscience will cause you to wander off into sin, and, 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 and it'll cease to warn you of evil. But if you are his, he keeps his hand on He will not allow you to stay in that condition for long. So we see in Joseph's brothers that God used problems and he used people and he used pain but the bible's full of other illustrations i mentioned them last week for david god used a man of god who had the guts to stand before the king and say you are the man he also used the death of a child 
For Samson, he used the loss of his strength and the loss of his eyes in a Philistine prison to get his attention. For Peter, he used a girl standing by a fire. God knows he will use whatever he needs to use. But one thing's for sure, whatever you use to get your attention, it will resurrect your conscience. Do not be deceived, God is not mocked, for whatever a man sows, this he will also reap. For the one who sows to his own flesh will from the flesh reap corruption, but the one who sows to the Spirit will from the Spirit reap eternal life. So how is the conscience saved? Please tell me, Tim, what can we do about this? All of a sudden, their consciences are alive and it doesn't feel well. They are certain that it all stems from the treatment of Joseph. They confess their sin. That's a good thing. They're talking to each other about it. And they confess it not knowing that Joseph could understand them. That is, it's, they said to one another, Truly we are guilty concerning our brother because we saw the distress of his soul when he pleaded with us, yet we would not listen. Therefore this distress has come upon us. Reuben answered them saying, Did I not tell you? Do not sin against the boy, but you would not listen. Now comes the reckoning for his blood. The secret that has been for 20 years is bubbling back to the surface and it, it brings them to the point where they're beginning to confess their sin. He sends nine brothers home. He keeps Simeon in prison. He sends the brothers there and he sends them the grain. I thought this was very nice. He goes ahead and sends them the grain that they need for the family and the live. And Jacob would have had servants and all those things. So it was a lot. He sends all of that back. Unbeknownst to them, he also puts the money back in their bags that they were going to pay with. <laughs> when they find that money, they're like, oh my, listen to what it says. Then he said to his brothers, my money has been returned, and behold, it is even in my sack. And their hearts sank. Do you understand the implication? They turned trembling one another. What is this that God has done to us? That guy in Egypt thought we were spies. Now we are thieves. We have all of this grain, and we're going back, and we've got our money back. And their attitude, God's out to get me. God's trying to destroy me. God's out to get them, but he's not trying to destroy them. He's trying to restore them. He's trying to bring them. But it, it feels that way, doesn't it? If you get caught in sin, you get in a bad place in your life, you're doing things you shouldn't do, you feel like God's trying to destroy me. God's trying to get rid of me. No, no, no. God's reeling you in. Okay? There is a difference. It is a huge difference. Here's what I want to take away from two weeks of this. The conscience can be cleaned. It can be cleansed. It can be trained. Some of you sit here today and you've allowed the world, the culture around you to change your opinion about things and how things, uh, uh, what is right and what is wrong. Listen to me now. As much as that culture has trained you, you can untrain that out and you can train in what God says about it, okay? So let's talk about five things. Five things to help you restore you from this place of guilt to a place of purity, okay? Number one, we've already talked about it. Confess and forsake all known sin. Confess and forsake all known sin. In 1 John chapter 1 and verse 8, you know, it, it, it tells us there that, that we will all sin from time to time. If, if you say you have no sin, you are a liar, right? But packed right between verses 8 and 10, which tell us that we're going to sin, is this verse, a, a, a word of, of, of pastoral instruction. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. See, when we sin, God does not require that we offer a sacrifice. He doesn't require that you do something new. There has been a sacrifice, and it was perfect. He has taken the blood of Jesus Christ and applied it to you. If you are saved here today, you need to understand this. When you sin, it does not remove the cleansing work of Jesus Christ. You say, well, Tim, that means people can go live like they want to. Yes, that's right. We live like we want to. And if you're a child of God, truly a child of God, you will want to live in honor of him, okay? So yes, it does let you live like you want to live. The problem is, is that at times, 
our want to gets messed up, right? We're sinful creatures. But if we're faithful, we confess that and get it clean, he takes care of it. So you say, well, what's the big deal about confessing then? Because confessing the sins, if I'm already covered, I'm already saved, why do that? Because it disrupts your relationship with God. It disrupts your fellowship with your fellow, with fellow believers around you. So we confess. Confess means that I acknowledge, God, you are right, that I agree, that I admit I am doing this, and it is wrong, and it is hurting me. God, forgive me. You don't say, I goofed, I messed up. A better term is, I missed the mark. I've sinned. I'm not who God wants me to be. And listen to me about confession. You listen and say, I am. Confession needs to be specific. Don't pray them little kid prayers when you lay down, God, forgive me for all my sins. You didn't, you didn't commit them like that. <laughs> you committed them one at a time, and they had names when you committed them. And guess what? They need to have a name when you confess them. So if you lied to somebody, you need to get right with God. You were dishonest in some way, treated somebody poorly. You need to say, God, I'm a liar. I'm a liar. I confess that before you. If you lusted in your heart after somebody, don't say, oh, don't try to shake it up. Say, God, I committed adultery, spiritual adultery in my heart. I let my eye wander. You slander against another person. You gossip against them. You name those things. Say, God, I have a murderous heart. You name them. We don't recite prayers over them. It's not a, a, mon a monotonous, a legalistic thing that we do. We had passion when we sin. We should confess with passion. God, this is wrong. It is wrong. It is our tendency to downplay sin, is it not? It, it, don't, you don't have to answer me. Yeah, we downplay sin. And what we do is that we think that somehow what it does is it makes our confessions weak and pathetic. Because we don't, we don't feel the power and the implication of sin. We need to elevate our vision of sin. Sin is wrong, it is terrible, and we need it. So when we downplay it, our conscience has a hard time resting. It nags at you. Deal with your sins God's way, and that is confession. That's what Bre Joseph's brothers did. We are, we are being, we are, this is happening because of the way we treated our brother. The Bible tells you, he who conceals his transgressions will not prosper, but he who confesses and forsakes them will find compassion. We've got to keep moving, or it won't get done again. The next two go together, so I'm gonna just, let's do it. Number two is, I need to seek forgiveness and make things right for all those you may have wronged. To be right with God, you've got to be right with other folks, Okay? Let me give you a couple of verses, and then we'll move to the next one. Matthew 5, 22, 23 and 24. Therefore, if you are presenting your offering at the altar, if you are coming to worship, and remember that your brother has something against you, leave your offering there before the altar and go. First be reconciled to your brother, and then come and present your offering. Do you not think that it is a big deal when you are not right with somebody that you need to get it right? God says that your worship is interrupted when you are not right with your brother or sister. Another verse, Matthew 6, 14 and 15. If you forgive others their transgressions, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others, then your Father will not forgive your transgressions. Okay? I told you the two go together. Number three, make restitution to those you have wronged if possible. The Old Testament and the New talk about making things right. That's what I mean by restitution. In the Old Testament, then the, uh, there are intricate details about if you, are, if you borrowed a, a mule from somebody and that mule dies, about how you're to make that right, you're to buy that mule, all of these things. I don't want, I'm not going to go down that road this morning, but I think about Zac Zacchaeus. You remember in Zacchaeus, when he got saved, he says, Behold, Lord, half of my possessions I will give to the poor, and if I have defrauded anyone of anything, I will give back four times as much. That man got saved. Why? He's going to make it right. He's going to get it right. 
Did you know that the Internal Revenue Service in the United States has what is called a conscience fund? Any of you ever heard this? Anybody? It's existed since 1811. <laughs> it is a fund that is set up for people who have defrauded the government in some way, and if it is bothering you, you can send money to it. It's collected millions of dollars. People that know they cheated on their taxes and it's just eating them alive, rather than going back, they send it all it, to, to what? To cleanse the conscience. <laughs> Isn't that crazy? That exists. It was crazy for me to read about this uh, this week because I, like, you've heard this probably, but this is where it came from. This guy owed this sum of money, but he says, he said, dear IRS, I have not been able to sleep. I cannot sleep because of the money that I owe. Enclosed is a cashier's check for $1,000. If I still can't sleep, I'll send the rest of it. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I'll send the rest of it. What was really great, there was one lady who sent this was back a long time ago, who sent nine cents in and used a three-cent stamp. <laughs> there was one lady who sent quilts that she had made in as restitution. A conscience fund. You know, many times the baggage that we have in our life comes because we have mistreated people. And we try to make that right some way, but we often get it wrong. I like Everyone Loves Raymond. I, 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 know, I, I know it's an older show, but, I, but, why? but uh, there's one of them where Allie, who is the little girl, has a hamster. And the, the family goes away, and, and Raymond is left at home, and Raymond's getting a fudge pop out of the freezer, and he leaves Pumpernickel. That was the name of the hamster. Pumpernickel in the freezer. In, actually, leaves it. Um, well, when they find it, that he's looking for it, all these crazy things, he's retracking, and anyway, Robert, his brother's there when he finds it. It was great. It was hilarious. But anyway, I digress. So Raymond's going to fix this. How do you think he fixed it? To get a new one. That's right. We're not to the point where we can freeze them and bring them back yet. So he gets a new one, all right? Did it work? No. Allie did not. Immediately, Allie recognized I, I thought about that. That's a common theme a lot of times in, in sitcoms. Somebody's watching the goldfish. They forget to feed it. It dies, so they go get another one. The cat or the dog runs away, so they try to replace it. Do they apologize? No, they don't apologize. They try to sneak in a new one. They try to do it their way. You know that the biblical admonition is, yes, we do restore. Yes, we do make it right. But we don't try to hide it. We tell them about it. We are totally honest about it. We get it all out on the table where everybody can see. We don't try to pull a switcheroo. What is this based in? It is based in the very character of God, that God is a God of justice. And as a God of justice, he wants to see things made right. When we hurt people, we need to make it right. That will help clean your conscience. Making things right works because that's God's way. That's God's way. Number four, this is about the timing. Don't wait to cleanse a wounded conscience. Don't wait to cleanse a wounded conscience. You know, the worst stains that you can have, I am the world's worst about dropping stuff on my shirts, you know? I make the joke all the time, it used to hit me in the lap, now it hits my belly. Um, but... The worst stains are the ones that are left unattended, that you don't do anything, you throw it in the dirty clothes, it sits there for days or whatever. I've read an interesting story about Sergeant Ray Bars, Bars, I think it is, Bars, B-A-A-R-Z, Bars. Sergeant Bars of the uh, Middale, Utah Police Department. He one day opened up his billfold, he was doing something, he pulled out his driver's license and looked at it for some reason, and it had expired. You know what he did? He took out his ticket book, and he wrote himself a citation. He said, I mean, they said, why did you do that? He said, how can I, at any time in the future, write somebody a citation for an expired driver's license when I was doing the same thing? I love the fact that he took care of it immediately. 
immediately. Deal with your guilt immediately. If you allow it to remain, then festers in your spiritual life. It begins to impact you. Not only will it deteriorate your spiritual life, it'll cause depression and anxiety and emotional problems. It'll affect you when you don't take care of things. And it will remain as long as the guilt is not came. So get it right fast, okay? And number five, here's a big one. Educate your conscience. I've been telling you for two weeks now, you can train your conscience. I am telling you right now to train it in the things of God. It's important to study your Bible. It's important to pray. Listen to me. You don't take advantage of this enough. I know you don't. It is important to talk to mature believers, to talk to them about things that you're dealing with, to get it out there. Because I promise you, there are, there are two things here. There, there are things that you, your conscience is allowing you to do. And when I say it's allowing you to do it, when you do them, there's no guilt. And there should be. It is sin, and you're not right in that. You have trained your conscience wrongly, therefore it's giving you false readings. You need to be more careful with your conscience because I guarantee you this, the Bible is very careful in its way of explaining things. But I also tell you the other side of the thing and that is that you are doing some things at times and you feel bad about them and they're really not sin. They're really okay. So the thing to do is to get this on track. See, the problem is, is that your experience or your past Ignorance led you to think that it was sinful, so therefore it's always there. The point is train it. Do you know what happens when we, I see it all the time, guys, where people are overzealous in what is wrong and right, they're, they're, that everything is wrong. It makes for a miserable Christian life, does it not? Where you feel like there is nothing in life that you can enjoy, that there's nothing. That is not God's way. That is not God's intention. Train yourself on the teaching of the Bible. The Bible says, Your word have I treasured in my heart that I might not sin against you. Your word is the key. Not what your friends say, what's not what some TV psychologist says. What does the word of God say about those things? To have a pure conscience, I need it on the word of God. Okay? I want to how do I put all I want to leave with this examination of our culture. Because I do think that every one of us in this room, every one of us, I'll start right here where I stand, have allowed our conscience to be seared to some level. I believe that with all my heart because I know it's in me. Maybe I, maybe I'm maybe I'm underestimating you. Maybe you're unseerable. Is that a word? It's amazing to consider our culture right now because we are enslaved to sex, we are numb to violence, and we are just literally terminally consumed with ourselves. Everything is about us. That is our culture around us. And our culture has declared war on guilt. We have said, oh, you should never feel guilty about anything. That's old-timey. That's medieval to have that kind of idea. It's unproductive. It's all of these things. As a matter of fact, people who encounter any level of guilt are rushed away to a psychologist or rushed away to somebody to help booster their self-image and get rid of the guilt. Now, I will tell you, let me just be clear here, I don't think guilt is healthy either, festering guilt. That's the reason I said you need to get rid of it quickly, right? Because God wants conviction, and he convicts you to get it right. He doesn't want you wallowing in guilt. So that out of the way, that does not mean there is not a place for guilt. If I do what is wrong before a holy God, I need to feel bad about it. If I do what is wrong before my neighbor, I need to feel bad about it. If I do wrong beside somebody who is below me on a social scale, I need to feel bad about that. Guilt is a good thing, and our culture is pulling that away from us. What is happening in our culture is it encourages sin, but it will not tolerate the guilt that comes with it. 
And that's the reason so many people, all they do is try to satisfy themselves and run from the guilt. But the answer to dealing with guilt is not to ignore it. That's the most dangerous thing that you can do. Therefore, God planted within you this gracious, powerful tool called your conscience. And you train your conscience properly, and then you can follow your conscience in those times. Will you please look within your heart today and ask yourself this question? Is your conscience pure? Here's a good way to measure. Is it helping you become more like Christ? Is it helping you to get closer to the Lord? If everything that you okay through your conscience is pulling you away from God, that is not pure conscience. Has your conscience been telling you to pull up on something? Pull up! Get out of here! And you're just saying, shut up, gringo, and turn in the system off. I would ask you that you ask yourself this. Has it been a long time since you heard from your conscience? That you're just not even paying attention anymore? So it's a good time for all of us to begin this process of dealing with what God lays on your heart today. I don't know what God's saying to you. This is such a wide topic. God could be dealing with you on any number of things. Throughout his administration, Abraham Lincoln was under fire. I mean, let's be honest. I mean, there was just time after time that people were questioning what he did, the scattering years of the Civil War, all the pressure that was put on him by that. And he, in his biography, said, I knew I would make mistakes. I knew that I would not make the right decision every time. But I also knew that it wouldn't be because I wanted to do something bad, but is that I inside was doing the best that I could. He resolved to never compromise his integrity. And it was so strong. Listen to this, okay? I desire so to conduct the affairs of this administration that at the end, when I come to lay down the reins of power... If I have lost every other friend on earth, I shall at least have one friend left, and that friend shall be down inside of me. Do you know what the reward of a clear conscience is? Of a trained, clear conscience? It is the reward of peace. That I have peace with others, that I have peace with God and that I have peace with myself. Our culture is full of people that just don't like themselves. That's not a teaching of the Bible. So the way that I deal with that is that I live my life with integrity, keep my conscience wary, (laughs) and listen to it when the alarm goes off. That couldn't have been any better timing. <laughs> deep, deep. I want you to bow your head, okay? I'm going to start here, okay? Some of you sit here today and your conscience is on fire right now because you're not where you need to be before the Lord. Your conscience is eating at you if you're lost and you need to come and give your life to Jesus Christ. You need to do that today because come talk to me will never embarrass you. Others of you have something that you're dealing with in your life, and you're not, you're not giving that thing totally to the Lord. And today is the day that you need to get that right. All of us here today need to come before the Lord and say, God, Lord, help me with my conscience. I know that this culture, my environment, has, has dulled my senses. And Father, give me a heightened sense of awareness of your presence and what you want from me. God, we give you this time. Work in people's hearts. Give them courage to move. God, I pray that we give ourselves to you. In Jesus' name, amen. You stand. We're going to sing, guys.
educate your conscience, then your conscience can be your guide, okay? Hey, find somebody, I mean, find our sign-up sheet for Wednesday night. Don't ask me where that came from. Our sign-up sheet for Wednesday night. I encourage some of you who haven't been on Wednesday night, come this week. You'll enjoy it. We have great meals, I promise you that, okay? So I hope that you'll come and be a part of that, all right? Anything else? Nothing? All right, Tom, I'm going to let you dismiss this, okay, brother?